for the uh, for the rest of the faculty. Um, why don't we Why don't we keep on mute until um, you know until you want to interject with uh, with a comment or a uh, discussion point? Wait, before I get started, Mark, you can see my screen, okay? Yep, looks good, Steve. All right, great. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's a real pleasure to to be able to show a case at this. Uh, this this has been really an exciting uh, seven weeks, and it's been fun to, to to do this. And it's gotten sadly enough in my life, it's gotten where I really look forward to Saturday morning and uh, signing on and and learning more about the pelvis and acid tapping. So so uh, great fun. So with that, um, I'll get started. I'm not going to really give you any uh, objectives because we'll have some take home points at the end because I just want to let this case kind of evolve and uh, I'll look forward to some input from uh, from my uh, part from my colleagues in crime here. So um, this is a 51 year old patient. Um, you can see it's fairly young, but with an extensive list of medical problems, which included diabetes for which he takes medic he takes pills and PO medication, but is poorly controlled. He is still a smoker, smokes two to three packs of cigarettes a day and uh, has significant COPD uh, hypertension. He's uh, had a cabbage from a coronary artery disease. He has chronic atrial fibrillation and is on eloquence and uh, has a pacemaker in place. So these are what he brought to the table and this is what he came with. He actually arrived at an outside hospital. He was hypotensive there. They gave him some crystalloid and two units of blood. He was a brief responder but they packed him up in an ambulance and sent him emergently to our hospital. He arrived at our hospital uh, and he got uh, started a massive transfusion pack. He got about six to eight units of additional blood uh, in the emergency department um, and uh, was found having a hemoperitoneum on his FAST exam. He also had a hemoneumothorax for which he had bilateral chest tubes. Um, and uh, on his pelvic x-ray, he was noted to have a hip dislocation with an astabular fracture. He was taken emergently to the operating room, we underwent exploratory laparotomy, he was found to have a liver injury that was uh, uh, con controlled the bleeding there and had a splenectomy for a uh, ruptured spleen. And this was his uh, injury AP pelvis x-ray, you can see here. Um, and I think um, we don't need to belabor the diagnosis here because this is, uh, I think everybody can recognize this person has an intact iliopectineal and ileoischial line um, and has a hip dislocation with a uh, appears to be a very large posterior wall. Um, I think the other key points here, um, at the end of the laparotomy, he was taken straight back to the in intensive care unit uh, because uh, they were still resuscitating him. And the uh, uh, residents made several attempts to do closed reductions. If you look, there are probably four or five x-rays uh, where they look all always like this. And I think the key point, I uh, think that's important here is uh, if you look, his radiologic roof, that's how much he has intact. The rest of it is over here. And if you look at his attempts at his, uh, to get Jude views, you can see the same thing. He has a very small part of his uh, radiologic roof intact. And, um, and then the rest of it over there. Um, we can pose a question to the expert panel a little bit. Is this somebody that should have had attempts at closed reduction? And, um, and, and what's the likelihood of being able to get that? But, Maybe we'll save that for a few minutes. And, and Mark, feel free to interject or interrupt at any time you, you feel appropriate. No, I think, I think that's a great question. And, and how much roof is enough to where you would tell them yes? And how much roof would you, you, know, would you look at on those x-rays and say, uh, don't bother or just put them in traction? This would be though when the... Uh, expert faculty actually turns their microphones on and, and chimes in. I would say that as soon as you see the arbitrator to confirm the size of that fragment, uh, you probably would um, be forced to the realization this won't reduce. So all you can do is pull it down while you're waiting for surgery um, so that you don't do any additional damage to the articular surface on the femoral head. Um, and that's because you know, it's this you got to this early, but this guy's going to be two to three days out. Your the head's going to stay lateral, but the best you can do is pull it down. Um, so, would you tell him not to even bother to try looking at this x ray, Keith? If I'd seen the original AP, I, I think the writing's on the wall. It's, it's not that there's just not enough to hold the head. So, multiple attempts. You can just, I can just sort of see cartilage disappearing with each attempt. 
yeah so that and i think that's a great message but yeah so yeah, and the, the question is do you try once or not I, but I, I, our guys were just trained to, to pull on things and they uh you know and it's that series which i it kind of breaks your heart to see a little bit but there's that series of about four or five x-rays all in a row you know where labeled as post-reduction x-ray or they keep trying and then they take another x-ray and they try again and take another x-ray and it's, it's too bad that uh, we didn't get involved early enough to stop that but just, just to sort of on the other side of the of the question i think if you see any um sort of any portion of the complete roof shadow even if it's attenuated you know, even with a very large or comminuted posterior wall fracture, there's usually enough roof to do a reduction and to to keep the head in. In this case, we don't see any any remaining significant roof shadow because it's all with the posterior wall. But a lot of times people will look at a comminuted, you know, a large posterior wall fragment that still does have some roof shadow intact and they'll say, oh, that's, that's not going to stay in. And, and it's remarkable how little acetabulum you actually do need though to keep the hip in but in this case i would agree with keith okay so good so th this is a you know it's a posterior superior wall acetabular fracture it was described by letternell in his book as was everything else that, that i think i've invented later on and the uh, uh, and so in the difference is the ones that involve the radiological roof um, as opposed to those that don't or these posterior superior wall fractures and again, I think the key point here is that uh, most of these can be reduced. Uh, there's just some of these rare ones like this that don't really have anything remaining. This is just a single picture of his coronal CT scan, and I think it gives you the idea. You can see, again, what we were just looking at, if you can see my cursor here, but you can see how much of the actual roof is remaining here, and the head has just fallen into where there should be. You know, the head should have, Astab should have followed along like this, but there's nothing there to hold this in place. Um, I'll show you the uh, CT scans here, and because uh, I think they're interesting to look at. But the uh, I'll scroll through it. Um, what you see here is the head riding up and it's into that defect where the wall used to be. And then if you look here, you can see that the entire dome of the acetabulum is to your left there, um, basically. And you can see how much is remaining in the actual acetabular fossa there just a very small amount of uh, remaining dome of the acetabulum. So basically this took off the entire acetabular dome. And unfortunately the posterior wall is very uh, comminuted in the remaining portion as well. Uh, just to show you the uh, coronal views as well uh, that we looked at one cut on. So we can scroll through that. And again, you can see the dome of the acetabulum uh, up there and you can see the head and the defect where the dome of the acetabulum used to be and the small remaining portion of the acetabulum. And then finally the sagittal cuts, which I think basically again give you the idea of how far anteriorly this, this comes around. So if we look when we get out toward the periphery of the acetabulum, you can see you know what remains, which is just that little tiny bit right there of uh, articular surface. So any fixation that we put in or any idea to see the anterior part of this fracture means we're going to have to be all the way basically to the anterior inferior spine to be able to see that part of the fracture. Okay, so I'll show you the 3D images for you as well. We've got multiple of those to look at and then I think we can maybe stop and have some brief discussion about ideas from there. But uh, again, you can see the dome of the acetabulum flipped out here. Um, here is the basically the um, entire dome of the acetabulum out here, uh, where uh, far from where it should be. Um, and again, just showing the amount of combination of the remaining posterior wall of the acetabulum. Just a cut looking at it from above, uh, which I think it shows nicely. You can see the actual acetabulum here, and this is the big defect where, where it should be and where the head was sitting uh, while we were waiting for surgery. Okay, so maybe um, we could get our expert panel back involved again and uh, uh, so this guy has an irreducible hip dislocation, um, currently uh, with this multifragmentary posterior superior wall fracture. It's a 51-year-old guy. He's got significant comorbidities. He just had an exploratory laparotomy. He has significant uh, blood requirements. Still has some hemodynamic instability. His lactate is still elevated uh, significantly, and, uh, um, and he is uh, in the process of continuing his ongoing resuscitation. So it's, uh, he arrived at... Uh, at our hospital about 10.30 in the morning. He's had a laparotomy. It's now early afternoon when they finished with him. Injury happened about eight o'clock in the morning. So um, 
I guess the questions that, that I think come up would be timing for his surgery, uh, the approach that you would use, uh, how would you get his head down? Do you do anything different to try to distract his head down into position so you're not fighting with that riding up highly? Um, patient positioning, fixation, and is there any role for a primary total hip? So, so Mark, I'll uh, open that up for some discussion here and then we can kind of go through what was done. Sounds good. Why don't we start with the, the timing issue? So let's say this guy was cleared and, uh, you know, what's, what's the urgency for intervening on his, uh, his acetabulum? In, in this case, it's, it's 1030. He's not cleared. We don't know when he's going to clear, but uh, let's say it was, uh, it was 1030 at night with the same injury or five o'clock at night with the same injury. Um, is this something that is, uh, is, needs urgent treatment before the next available OR in the morning. So I'll, I'll see if there's any, anybody, if anybody wants to chime in here from our panel. I think Hi, it's Mike. Is, go ahead. Hi, it's Mike Stover. I think that um, there's really not a head at risk currently. The head is dislocated. It's uh, I don't think there's a risk to the vascularity and really there's not a potential wear pattern for the head with such a large wall. I think that it would be best to probably put the patient in traction and do the patient when he's medically and medically stable and there's an appropriate team available to perform the surgery. Keith, you were getting ready to say something was yeah, I mean, I I, this this is an unusual enough pattern that I would want to have home core advantage, which means I'd want the best people available and enough people and uh, that I could do it with a relatively low stress environment. So uh, I definitely would not start this late. I think Mike's right. I mean, the wear pattern, I wasn't sure whether there was an impaction of the femoral head on, on that um, uh, coronals or not. It uh, certainly could be. The wear is going to be medial. Um, if you're going to lose cartilage, that's probably the, the best place to lose it. Um, but I think just skeletal traction pending the best possible logistical setup for whatever your institution is. Okay. So we could probably summarize by saying it should, should be done as soon as the patient is ready and you're ready. And that should be, that shouldn't be next week sometime, but it should be, um, should be soon, but uh, not not in a less than ideal situation, and not on a patient who's un medically or unstable. Good. All right. Approach. Well, so let me ask you, Steve. What what's your limit for a prone coker in terms of anterior exposure, both for reduction and for fixation? Yeah. So. Um, you know, I think the, um, uh, I don't know that I have a hardcore answer to that. The coker laying back part doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, we talk about doing a straight line Gibson um, and people say that that gives you better superior wall exposure. Um, and, and maybe it does, but I, you know, for me, I, I don't think that what I'm normally fighting is the skin, it's the, it's the abductor. So I don't know that where you place your skin incision or where you divide the maximus or whether you go anterior to the maximus makes a big difference. Um, the, uh, the real question is, when do you need to do some uh, 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 a token or something to give you better exposure? And I, I don't have a hardcore answer. I can tell you that you know, in, just in my own sort of anecdotal brain, I've kind of come up with the idea that, that if I think I need exposure or fixation that's higher than the roof of the sciatic notch or that's beyond the 12 o'clock position on the acetabulum, if looking at it as a clock face, then I start thinking about how uh, that I have some concerns about seeing the extent of the fracture and considering uh, other types of uh, approaches or extensions of approaches. You say uh, higher than the roof of the sciatic notch in, in terms of the posterior wall or yeah. fractures that go above the roof of the greater sciatic notch? I would say uh, as far as the posterior wall, yeah. Okay. For extension, you know, it, 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 uh, then I need to see higher than that. Yeah, referring to wall fracture, sorry. Other faculty members want to comment on approach? 
Yeah, I think the, the point that Steve made in terms of the, the cranial anterior extent is very good. I think when I'm starting to look at the CT scans, anything that with the fracture line, again, getting more cranial, more anterior, like over that 12 o'clock position, if it's more than two centimeters uh, plus over the head, um, that's just the apex of the fracture. And then I'm worried about getting some sort of fixation, plate fixation to, to be on top of that. And so it makes me want to think about something else as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not only that you're something, I mean, even if you can see it, what the worry for me is that I'm stretching so hard that I'm going to be uh, doing damage to the superior gluteal nerve uh, and possibly artery and vein as well. Agreed. I would think the I, other I think thing also, uh, also in this circumstance, I think the position of the wall fragment anterior to the head in a prone position would make it very difficult to even retrieve that fragment. Uh, prone because it'd be hard to mobilize the abductors sufficiently to get that back and over. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a key point. Um, it's that, fra that anterior fragment um, is rotated 90 degrees. And so you have to be always cognizant of what your technique for getting things that are anterior to the head. I think if you pull this down with traction, your access to, to that fragment will be better. And we're hoping that there still is a capsular pedicle on it, but there'll be times when this is an entirely free fragment that you can't take advantage of that pedicle whatsoever. So, and if you're prone and there's something anterior to the head that you can't get, then uh, that's end game and you're gonna have to reprep and redrape uh, in a different position. So. I think it's part of the, the key part is when these multi-fragmentary is that you can have a full inventory of all your fragments and you have a strategy for being able to get to all of them and then make sure that you account for them interoperatively so at the end of the case you don't uh, end up with something that's missing. I mean your access into the joint is enhanced by the size of the wall especially posteriorly um, and so you don't have that issue, but stuff in front of the joint is a huge problem, or at least it can be. Okay, so that's all great points. So yeah, so for, for me, I felt like I needed to be lateral for the reasons you say, and, and I, I'm, I'm always concerned. I, I don't like doing Coker Langebex in the lateral position if I have a choice, just because I feel like uh, the patient flops back and forth so much the way I position them that I don't feel like I can maintain sterility posteriorly as well. So given that and given, the concerns about being posterior and superior, um, we uh, we chose um, to do a Gibson approach. So he was actually not stable enough to go to the operating room until the next day, and it was uh, uh, not able to be cleared in time for the first case. He was actually done about uh, noon the following day. Uh, that's when he was taken to the operating room. Did him in the lateral position. Um, as far as getting the head down, I thought that there would be some advantage to uh, having something to help pull it down. So we actually made some makeshift traction. We put him in a lateral position, put a big stack of towels under his knee to abduct his leg some to try to make the head seat into the acetabulum and put uh, just put a distal femoral traction pin in with the rope that we threw over the end of the bed over a device we had at the end of the bed to try to give us some um, makeshift traction. Uh, I did a, a Gibson approach for the trochanteric flip osteotomy and uh, used buttress plates to try to get our uh, fixation and I'll show you. Steve, so logistically, is the leg prep free here? Yeah, the leg is free. So we have, it's, it's completely in, it's, the leg is in the sterile field and free. And, okay, uh, how, did, how did you manage the prep? I mean, ma I mean manage, guess what I did, but, um, yeah. Yeah. How do you prep the leg while it's in traction? Oh, well, it wasn't in traction. So we prepped it out of a tra you know, We prepped the leg completely sterile. We had a traction pin in distal femur, completely prepped the leg free, and then hooked a traction bow, a sterile traction bow onto the traction pin. We have sterile rope that we tie to the traction bow, and then we threw that off. The, we had the, we had, um, some of the old OSI traction stuff on the end of the bed that we can throw something over the end of it. So that was actually just thrown over the end of a bar at the end of the bed, and then weights were tied on that at the end of the bed. I guess I, my, my concern is always um, during the prep, what's happening to the head. So this is one where I would bring in the, do a cross table PA 
and find out where the head is at the beginning. And usually you put a little bit of traction and, if, and quite a bit of abduction, the head can be made to seat. And then with external rotation, you're depending on the anterior hip capsule to, to, as a check rein. And if you hold it in that position, it usually requires two people to prep because somebody's got to hold it. And I think you can minimize the potential for additional soft tissue injury. And maybe it's not that much, but I, I, the prep is very difficult for these, I think, because it's the head's moving around. And sometimes you can hear things you don't want to hear in the process. So uh, I, I, I will tell you that I, I did hold his leg. I do hold the leg for things like this myself while somebody else preps it. Because yeah. I, I, I don't think I'm holding it reduced, but I just feel like I don't like to walk in the room and see them with the usual thing where it's externally rotated and somebody's basically pushing on it. Um, additionally, it makes the approach a lot harder. I don't know if you've tried to do uh, a uh, approach to the hip with the hip dislocated, but the, when the trochanter is not where it normally lives, it you know when we use that kind of for our guide for the approach, it makes it a lot more difficult. And when it's lateral to where it normally is as well, it makes it makes the approach a lot more challenging. So something to think about when you're doing it. Um, so the show we did do with Gibson, the modified Gibson approach, basically with a straight line incision. Um, as we said, I think it might give you some advantages for the supraacetabular area. It gives you the same, pretty much the same retroacetabulum access as long as you keep the hip extended, uh, but very limited access, I think, to the uh, greater sac to work within the greater sciatic notch. Did the trochanteric osteotomy and uh, did not do a surgical dislocation, just the osteotomy to give us visualization. And you can see in this maybe you can tell, but this is actually the anterior inner, uh, anterior, inferior spine basically right here. So you can get access and, and plate fixation all the way around uh, with an osteotomy like this. You need to have some ideas how you're going to do distraction. We did it with traction, but you can do it with a, with a fracture table or you could do it with a, a universal distractor with pins uh, in the pelvis and in the femur to help pull that down if you wanted to. The disadvantages of these things we've talked about already is that you don't have a free leg to be able to manipulate some. Um, so I'll just kind of go through this, the case a little bit with the CRM images that we had. You can see how we were able to get the head pulled down reasonably well. It's not all the way down, but, and to get it to seat fairly well in the acetabulum. I think that's important because it's hard to get that wall piece to sit back in place when it's the entire dome of the acetabulum, um, when it's, uh, if the head is riding up superiorly. Uh, we then able to kind of push this back in place and put a couple of K wires to hold it there. Um, and then um, from there, um, put these little buttress plates to try to help complete the reduction. You can see it still gapped a little bit there, but uh, these, these screws are here and here are just at the superior edge of the uh, acetab. And we put the little two hole plate on first just to trap that fragment. And then we put one down that came down a little bit further down onto it um, with the idea we'd close this down. These, were le these we leave in place and they actually do serve as a real buttress plate since we're trying to resist that shear component going superiorly, just like you do with the, if you turn this up down, upside down and thought about a tibial plateau fracture. Uh, once we did that, we added our butt. Our so Steve, butt particularly with the comminution that you have of the inferior uh, posterior wall, it would it'd be really easy to have the femoral head still be sitting a little lateral and the superior fragment would look reasonably good, except on an AP x-ray, you'd see a gap in the roof. And I, I think you saw that initially on, on some of your earlier fluoro shots. Yeah, you still see just a little bit there, I think, too. Still a little, it's a little bit yep. lateral and you can see a little gap there as well. Uh, we were hoping to close that down with lag screws and with the final buttress plate that we put on top, which I think we basically did. Um, but you can see the additional buttress plate here. Um, and there was multiple fragments of the posterior wall. Inferiorly, we were able to get one piece big enough to kind of get some fixation into and put a lag screw into that as well. Added a second plate. And basically just kind of corralling all of those uh, other posterior wall fragments beneath the plates to kind of keep them in position. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like at the end. Um, and I'll go back just to show you that uh, again, that I think one of the points is you can see how we're able to get our fixation. This wall fracture comes all the way out to here. So we're able to get fixation beyond that. And, and to do that it really requires the screws that go almost all the way to the anterior inferior spine to be able to get that actually trap that fragment beneath it. And I think that'd be very difficult to do through any other type of uh, exposure other than maybe with a 
in, with a trochanteric osteotomy. These are his post-op x-rays and they're, I'll apologize because I think they're really ugly x-rays because there's so much metal that it kind of overbears everything, but I'll just show you the post-op films. This was him coming back at four months. He still, main th he's one of those guys, every time he comes to clinic, I hold my breath and hope that he's not dislocated again. And, uh, and this is him at 14 months out. This was the last x-rays I have of him. Um, you can see his hip is not normal, but uh, hip remains congruently reduced. Um, and he's actually got fairly good function. Um, you can see the uh, iliac oblique view and the obturator oblique view as well. So, um, so he is, uh, I have about four, four and a half year follow up on him clinically. Um, uh, almost, uh, I think the last office visit he had, he, he goes to see his primary care doctor because of all his multiple medical problems. He sees a cardiologist regularly as well. He's actually got good function. He walks with uh, no assistive devices. He takes an anti-inflammatory occasionally, but that's for a rotator cuff tear that he has, not for his hip, and uh, has not had to have a hip replacement in, the, in that four to five year interval since uh, from a clinical standpoint. So take home points, um, posterior superior wall fractures are challenging. They have much higher failure rates in the literature. You need to consider uh, an approach modification that will give you adequate visualization to see the anterior and superior extent of the fracture so you can actually see the fracture margins. Um, a modified Gibson or Coker Langenbeck approach for the trochanteric flip osteotomy uh, is safe and will give you supraastabular access that you can't get uh, safely to other approaches. Um, and uh, additional fixation with true buttress plates may help improve the outcomes with this group of injuries. So that's it, Mark. I'd be happy to take any questions or um, hey, Steve. Any points. Yes. Do you have any um, any points or keys that can help us extend the exposure through the uh, Gibson? I know that Roy Moe talked about extending it all the way up to the iliac crest or even peel the little anterior. Um, especially when the patients are kind of, especially if you do it prone, but in a lot of positions to find it a little tight sometimes. Yeah, so I, I mean, so yeah, I agree. I, I usually do make my skin incision just because I guess I'm more of a trauma guy than a reconstructive guy. I, I tend to make my incision to the, all the way to the iliac crest. So I make a longer skin incision. I don't normally take the gluteal sling down, but I guess you could consider that. But, uh, but I think the real key is to keep the hip in extension. So any flexion of the hip at all tends to really tighten those posterior structures and makes the retroastabular surface very difficult to see. Um, as far as seeing superiorly, I, you know, I think that's just freeing, continuing to free up across the anterior capsule and, uh, and working anteriorly enough to, to be able to really mobilize that, uh, that sling with the uh, digastric uh, piece of bone attached to it. I think hip extension though is really important and, and really keeping it extended the whole time. Steve, why don't you go ahead and un unshare yours and Phil, you can start sharing your screen while we uh, see. DS, were there any more, uh, any more questions in the, in the Q&A to, to address toward uh, to Steve? No, there was a few questions about whether an extended iliofemoral would be useful in this case. And, you know, I think that um, that's really not going to, provide any advantage with significant uh, morbidity as we heard about uh, compared to what was done here with a Gibson and a trochanteric osteotomy. Yeah, I think I would agree. It certainly would give you the visualization you would need, but uh, at a much higher cost. 